My name is Maren Byrne, and I'm a, a grant writer at IATP. I've been at IATP for about five years. And IATP is your host this evening, and it's also the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. And we've been around since uh, 1986, and we're a, a nonprofit right here in Minneapolis. Um, our mission is to work locally and globally at the intersection of policy and practice to ensure fair and sustainable food, farm, and trade systems. And that's just kind of a fancy way to say that we do a lot of stuff that's all connected by concern about um, crops and how they're grown, the food we eat, who grows it, how it's bought and sold, and how it impacts both our health and the economy. And we do that here in Minnesota, we do that nationally, and we do that internationally. And um, it's this larger picture viewpoint that makes us unusual, I think, among those doing similar work. And uh, we specialize in recognizing the interconnections between things that might not obviously be connected. Uh, a fun fact that not everybody knows about IATP is that um, we actually founded and still own Peace Coffee, who are our hosts this evening. And we love Peace Coffee because they're a great example of how a business can be run in a way that's good for everyone involved, from the growers to the buyers to the sellers, um, all the way around. Um, we've got a couple other IATP folks here tonight. Dale, who just walked in, is our VP for Communications. Patrick, running the camera, is our uh, web guru. Andrew here in uh, the pink shirt, works in Communications. And then Steve tonight is our, our guest expert. Um, oh, I forgot Patty, our librarian. Sorry, we're sitting too low. Uh, Steve is a senior policy analyst at IATP, and he works on agriculture, trade, and food safety policy. Um, the event you're at tonight is called Percolate, and Percolate is an ongoing series of discussions similar to this. It's every other month on the fourth Thursday, and we will talk about just about anything, as long as it's related to IATP. So we've talked about um, Harmless Tool, the internet technology, the right to water, uh, challenging corporate power in the food system, and a bunch of other things. And I'm always looking for topics. So if there's something that you would love to spend an hour and a half discussing with smart people, let me know, drop me an email, and I'll make sure that it gets on the list. Um, as a nonprofit, all of our work, including this group, is made possible by the generosity of others. So I'd ask that when you do your charitable giving, that you keep IATP in mind. And if you're so moved tonight, I've got donation envelopes over there on the table. If you're joining us online, www.iatp.org slash donate. Are you also on the We are, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, we are being webcast tonight for the first time, so if you know anybody who watches us, on the webcast, maybe have them drop us an email and tell us how it went because it's kind of an experiment. Um, probably start tonight just by going around the room quickly and everyone will give their name and in 10 seconds or less, and I'm dead serious about that 10 seconds, just say what brought you here tonight. And that can be as simple as I just wanted to learn more about um, acronym trading. I'll go first. My name is Maren Byrne and I'm here because uh, uh, I'm Steve Sukan, and I'm a senior trade policy analyst with IATP. Uh, I'm Dale Meehouse, and I love to write to be, and I'm here because every time I listen to Steve, I don't know what's wrong. My name's Mary Schlockhoff, and I'm here because I work My 
name is Greg Schmidt. Um, I've been to a number of Purple Lake um, events, and they're always very informative. So. I'm Mallory. Um, we all love NASA, right? So I thought I'd come and learn about the new. Scott, I think. Scott Russell, a uh, freelance writer and researcher, and uh, I've been a couple of these and always done them. Yeah. And then our, our newest guest. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anna Nessus. I'm um, really excited to be talking. Welcome back. I'm Steve, we'll get started. And uh, Steve is a really nice guy, and so I can guarantee you that if anyone has any questions throughout the evening, um, this is not a formal event. Please feel free to speak up and ask whenever something doesn't make sense. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much for coming. It's been such a lovely evening. Uh, it's a real testimony to your interest in this topic to be able to uh, not enjoy the evening uh, fully and, and come here and uh, discuss uh, with us a new and somewhat uh, complicated topic. I'm going to uh, make this presentation in five parts. The first part will be the longest. Um, and then between each section, we will we will discuss. Um, we can discuss what I just talked about, or we can discuss what you do know about the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. And um, I don't have a lot of show and tell items, but I, I thought that uh, you should be aware that in the, in the paper of record for agribusiness, uh, the trade, the, what we'll call the TTIP for now, uh, is front page news, right? So agribusiness firms are very much interested in the transatlantic uh, trade investment partnership. Uh, so the, the, the five parts of this of this presentation. There's been a transatlantic uh, free trade agreement uh, discussed, proposed to some extent, since about 1990, what, what, so what, what events, what forces have led to the launch of these talks uh, on July 8th? Then the, the, uh, the, the second part of, um, of the presentation uh, has to do with uh, the, the kind of working off the Percolate title, uh, the biggest trade agreement you've never heard of. And basically it's about the procedural secrecy uh, uh, involved in the agreement, and is that going to lead to uh, substantive inefficacy, even for the stated uh, goals of the agreement? Uh, the, the third part concerns um, some of IATP's uh, substantive concerns about the TTIP, not just the procedural matters, but the, uh, but the different uh, sectors um, and public policy issues that are involved. And the fourth part is what is, what is IATP doing or what will IATP do uh, about uh, the TTIP, the, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and other uh, free trade agreements. And then the last part uh, is where you're going to get to speak the most. This is what can you do about the TTIP and, and other uh, uh, free trade agreements. And I'll be speaking very briefly and hopefully you'll be speaking a lot more. So. Uh, you're going to have to put up with a little more of me uh, at the outset, basically, to the background. Um, so the kind of general framing question of, of this uh, first part of the presentation is um, whether, as President Obama says, uh, the TTIP is a 21st century trade agreement. Um, the contention is, that by adding uh, chapters on innovation uh, and trade and environment and sustainable development um, and, uh, and research cooperation, that this is a different kind of, of trade agreement. Alternatively, uh, our friends at Public Citizen uh, refuse to call the TTIP, the, the TTIP, they refer to it as TAFTA, uh, which of course rhymes with NAFTA and uh, makes us think about uh, NAFTA's uh, many well-documented failures. Um, and 
if we think of it uh, basically what is happening here is uh, TAFTA with uh, some public policy non-binding uh, rule declaration, then we have to ask ourselves, why is it that the Obama administration uh, wishes to uh, make policy, public policy vulnerable to um, challenges in court by transnational corporations? Why would we give away uh, non-discriminatory public policy uh, and regulation, regulations that uh, do not discriminate, as they say in the jargon, between foreign companies and U.S. companies. So, one of the reasons that um, the, the, I'm just going to call it the TTIP and, and, and other free trade agreements have proliferated is because the projections of benefits from the uh, World Trade Organization uh, agreements have, have not come to fruition. Uh, even the World Bank uh, admits that um, there are only about a dozen beneficiaries um, of the WTO agreements, just in the, the, the simplest kind of GDP, uh, gross domestic product terms, um, and that you have you know, well over 130 developing country members of the WTO uh, and uh, the beneficiaries uh, in Brazil, Vietnam, China, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, a relative handful among all of the uh, of all the members, and this is in part because so many of these members depended for their trade revenues on agriculture, and uh, and those agricultural uh, benefits were not forthcoming, and yet these companies assumed uh, very great and costly obligations uh, to open up their service markets, uh, to undertake to protect. Uh, U.S. and European and Japanese patents. Um, essentially, uh, the, uh, the trade balance between import costs and export revenues uh, was decidedly against most developing countries uh, who have seen uh, direct foreign investment in developing countries drop by an aggregate $700 billion uh, since 2007, according to the UN Conference on Trade Development. So you've got a, a, a situation where the WTO agreements uh, have not worked as promised. And so during the last decade, uh, more than 2,000 uh, bilateral and uh, regional free trade agreements uh, have been agreed because of the gross domestic product of around $34 trillion in the 28 uh, European Union member states and the United States combined. This is supposed to be uh, the mother of, of all uh, free trade agreements. Now, especially in Europe, but I think also in the United States, one of the reasons that um, the TTIP has been launched is because of some search and source for economic growth. Uh, following the economic stagnation that, that resulted from the blow-up of the financial services industry from 2007-2009. Uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank, according to a study uh, by the Levi Economics Institute, Bard College, poured $30 trillion uh, into the banks to rescue them from their extremely uh, risky products and the deregulation of the financial services industry, especially in Britain and, and the United States. And yet, uh, despite this huge infusion of public capital, uh, there were no conditions put on the investment in real goods and services. So uh, instead of uh, structuring financial products for long-term finance, for example, for our, our terrible $2 trillion plus uh, infrastructure investment just in the United States alone. In, in St. Paul, uh, uh, most of the, uh, of the sewer and water delivery infrastructure was built prior to 1920. And this is typical uh, across the United States. So we have massive uh, infrastructure uh, uh, failures waiting to happen, you know, bridges, sewers, uh, uh, ports, highways, and so on and so forth. Uh, so there's been a firm rejection of that kind of infrastructural investment by banks that want very quick, uh, very quick profits, and so they return to 
um, creating financial products that allegedly transfer risk away from the customers. And their customers uh, include most of uh, the Fortune 500. And a lot of these, a lot of these products invert, in, 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 involve um, interest rate arbitrage, so you're basically betting on uh, different interest rates and interest rate policies in among different countries. A huge amount of speculation in foreign currency uh, uh, derivatives, which, which basically affects the prices of, of all goods and services. Uh, the global derivatives market, and this is a very rough estimate uh, reported to the Bank for International Settlements, this year was around $650 trillion. Now that's that's not netted trades, that's basically what is reported uh, by the banks uh, to the treasuries for the purpose of deciding how much how much uh, currency, how much credit should they create without without launching inflation. It's kind of a, a, a balancing act. They have to report something in order to let uh, you know, the US Treasury and other finance ministries know what is needed uh, in terms of currency uh, for the sake of business transactions. Uh, another reason that the, the TAF is being launched is that uh, employment is just abysmal. Um, the successful uh, U.S. sectors, uh, kind of the flagship companies such as Google are not big job creators. Uh, in Europe especially, where you have devastating uh, austerity pro uh, uh, policies since 2007, um, there is huge unemployment. In Spain, the unemployment rate among uh, youth, people under 35 years of age, is about 56%. In Greece, it's likewise around 56 percent. Even I mean, this is worse even than um, uh, among African American youth. The unemployment rate is about 40 percent. Um, African Americans, in general, around 15 percent. So, uh, as awful as the situation is in the United States, that there's a lot of tricky ways to measure employment that don't include underemployment. And, and a uh, and, and huge increase in uh, temporary you know, contract positions without benefits or any job security. But, but even compared uh, uh, to the, the abysmal US job creation uh, situation, Europe is really quite desperate. As Paul Krugman in the New York Times said, uh, you have uh, uh, the acolytes of austerity saying that if we, if we cut taxes enough, uh, if we cut benefits, if we, uh, if we develop what's called labor flexibility, that is cutting uh, trade union laws and contracts, investors will develop confidence uh, enough to uh, invest in real goods and services. And this is what Krugman calls the confidence ferry. And the confidence ferry has not, uh, has not made an appearance. So, uh, the, uh, uh, well, but one more example of, of, of the failure of the confidence ferry to appear. Uh, George Osborne, who's the British equivalent of our Secretary of Treasury, uh, said in 2008, um, after they had launched their austerity program, that by 2013, uh, prosperity would return uh, to the United Kingdom as measured by increases in gross domestic product above 2% above annually. And, and just about a month ago, he said, well, there, there have been some miscalculations of you know, misapplication of the policies, uh, Germany has been bad, and so on and so forth, and now prosperity has been pushed off uh, to 2018, perhaps 2019, by which time, of course, uh, George Osborne will be retired with a very big fat pension. Uh, that only high level governments here get. So another factor in the um, in the launch of the TTIP is that there is a very concerted corporate lobby called the Transatlantic Business Council. So basically, your uh, Fortune 500 plus the banks, um, at the Transatlantic Business Council, and they have a a, a fairly encyclopedic plan to remove what they call trade irritants. The trade irritants are, are the non-tariff trade barriers. So, so uh, tariffs are are taxes 
that are imposed upon, upon imports. And uh, the, the tariffs between the United States and the 28 European uh, Union member states are quite low on most products. And so there's not a lot of room for removing tariffs. However, there are um, food safety and uh, labeling and uh, what are called geographic indicator barriers and so on and so forth uh, that these businesses uh, wish to remove. And um, unlike uh, previous iterations of the proposed transatlantic uh, uh, free trade agreement, this time they really mean business because they proposed uh, an investment, they proposed to give private corporations, private investors, and the, and the term investor is very, very loosely defined, uh, the right to sue governments uh, for loss of anticipated profits as a result of regulations which they judge to be least restrictive trade. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but this is a really major, major change. Can you go over the areas again that these are in? It's, so is it, when you say geographic indicators, you mean like local? How well? It's yeah. Lo local preference really comes under the area of government procurement, okay. and that's another that's another chapter. Of that. Yeah, ge I, I can explain geographic preference maybe if, when I talk about substantive issues. Okay. okay. So there's a whole. At any rate, there's there's nothing in this agreement that would fall under the right of corporations to sue the governments for rules that could treat foreign and U.S. investors equally, but by the, in the judgment of the trade lawyer tribunals, that would probably be located in the world. Uh, these would, as they say in business, nullify and impair the anticipated benefits of the T2. Um, and so you have uh, uh, econometric estimates of uh, of what will be gained by the TTIP, and usually these are projected far enough out so that nobody can you know, do a substantive study to determine whether they're likely, but they usually go out to 2025 or 2027. They're assuming that the TTIP will be uh, implemented by uh, 2018, 2019, and then thereafter you will have a period of implementation that will result in uh, well, For example, uh, the Center for Economic Policy in London uh, projects a $157 billion uh, addition to uh, the European economies and about $125 billion uh, addition or $866 per family to the United States economy. Um, of course, benefits from trade are never uh, distributed equally, much less on a family basis. And so this is always kind of a silly uh, PR tactic that uh, trade policy is like. Well, it, it, you know, it, it, it's it's something that if you take a look at the econometric policy uh, scenarios, they're they're so uh, idealistic. For example, they assume uh, that there will be no uh, you know, major incidents of food safety contamination or animal health disease, or uh, that there will not be another financial blow, and so on and so forth. So, you, you take a look at these these benefits, which are actually quite puny when you compare them to uh, $13 trillion lost over three years due to the deregulation of the financial services industry. And this agreement, as proposed, includes the financial services chapter. So it, it, uh, it has very great potential uh, for uh, placing both economies uh, in, in a position of, of subjugation, subordination, to what is essentially a transatlantic financial industry. For example, uh, according to a, a, U, a, a U.S. Federal Reserve Bank of New York study, uh, Goldman Sachs has over 2,500 foreign affiliates. About half of those are in, in European Union countries. And so essentially, this is, a, this is a U.S. headquartered bank, but it is really a global entity. And, and still, uh, our politicians in Washington talk about financial services as if it were somehow uh, a national industry that we were trying to protect uh, nationally. So I think, you know, just kind of closing question, uh, you know, one of the, one of the 
claims that's made or has been made thus far by the PTIP is that it will enable uh, small and medium-sized businesses to uh, to grow because they will you know, be trading I don't know, solar panels to Romania or what have you. Um, and you know, question is, is this growth going growth to occur um, in companies large enough to have enough benefits uh, to create the kind of uh, uh, gains in employment and gains in uh, industry skills uh, that are claimed for it. Um, and I think you, know, you really do have to look uh, historically um, to some extent that there are new industries that are proposed to be covered by this agreement. And so uh, those need to be looked at also. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in the subsequent part of the talk. So that's the longest section. Now you can uh, fire away. Uh, my, my first question is, uh, as I mentioned before, before coming here, I was aware of a specific partnership, but I wasn't aware of the Atlantic version. Are they, it sounds quite similar. Uh, they're shrouded in secrecy, a lot of benefits for business, uh, at the expense of um, health and, and uh, Civil rights, I don't know if I want to say that, but are, is there some similarity between the two of the Atlantic, transatlantic and transatlantic civil rights? So, um, the U.S. Trade Representative and other trade negotiators um, usually operate off a template, uh, both for reasons of legal you know, consistency, uh, but also because their staffs are relatively small. I mean, if you look at the staff of the U.S. Trade Representative compared to the Department of Commerce, which actually has to do the heavy lifting uh, on, on trade and uh, trade data uh, analysis and registration. So kind of for reasons of trade negotiating economy, they have to have some degree of consistency. On the other hand, you're dealing with uh, sovereign, more or less sovereign governments. And so then these governments push back, and they want carve-outs from the agreements. And so, for example, uh, Australia has decided that investor state is not such a great idea, and they don't want it on a TTIP. Well, if they and Japan don't have investor state in the agreement, other other countries, other potential members of, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on and so forth, are going to ask themselves, well, why do we want that? You know, why would we? Why would we agree to that? Um, in, in the services chapter, you do have um, some kind of country-specific uh, obligations because some countries have um, certain service sector industries, other countries don't. You know, so there are some kind of unique um, aspects with regard to um, the two those two different regional agreements. One thing about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, though, is that. Um, it, the people who launched it uh, were thinking about ways to exclude China. How do we how do we box China in? How do we use this regional trade agreement as a so-called soft power foreign policy tool? Um, and you know, right now it, it, it doesn't look like it's so terribly successful. I mean, China uh, China's um, foreign direct investment arm uh, invests more in developing countries than the World Bank and the IMF combined. Uh, you know, so they carry quite a lot of clout, and they also don't put the kind of conditions on their loans. I mean, whenever you have bilateral U.S. development systems, all contracts must be made with U.S. Uh, contractors. And so, you know, the Monsanto system is the role. Cargill, uh, Walmart, so on and so forth, they're the major contractors and beneficiaries of this so-called Ford A. So, you know, that, but but at least in terms of structure, the agreements will look pretty similar. They need to, otherwise um, it would be impossible to um, defend them in the case of trade litigation. Yeah, um, two questions. First of all, the U.S. Trade Representative indicates that there are many trade representatives and where, to, to what entity are they representative to? Um, so the, the trade representative, Michael Froman, is uh, 
a law school colleague, President Obama. President Obama has a fatal attraction to Harvard and University of Chicago graduates, continuing with the appointment of Froman. Froman was uh, uh, previously the head of the National Security Council, and so he brings a kind of national security approach uh, to trade policy. He's also, of course, the Goldman Sachs banker uh, in his previous career. And so they are the, the U.S. Trade Representative's office is a presidential office, so the authority um, resides with the president. The president can, um, you know, provide for, for example, he could he could reverse the secrecy of uh, of the U.S. Trade Representative's office with an executive decree. And, and are there are there other? I'm assuming there are other trade representatives from other countries. And what is the what is the entity under which they all collaborate? Well, different countries have different uh, ministries, but generally what, what you'll have in a negotiations team are representatives from the different uh, departments that are affected, and so there'll be you know, a few people from the Foreign Agricultural Service, there'll be a couple people from the Food and Drug Administration, maybe a person from the Environmental Protection Agency. Steve, I think he's asking, like, about the WTO, like, like, where, you're asking where they all meet. Well, yeah, I mean, like, where is their... a state representative goes to St. Paul, and they're part of the House of Representatives. Who are these, what, what organization, with what authority, or is this just, are, are they not a representative, they're just sort of a, uh, a, a spokesperson? Or, I don't even know how, what term I would use to describe them. They're representing the president and meeting with people who okay. represent other. So other this isn't things. part of the UN or part of the WTO? Oh, no, 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 no. This is, uh, okay. uh, you know, basically. They're sort of like ambassadors. Um, I mean, trade ambassadors. Yeah, for the, yeah, for the, for their heads of state, okay. basically. Mm -hmm. right. And then the other question was, and you mentioned <clears throat> Monsanto, which leads me to wonder how much of, because Monsanto's obviously having big issues around the world um, in a number of things, and, and obviously they would like to reverse that. And so I've heard that, that some of the things that they're talking about, some of these trade packs, are, would force countries who are trying to, to declaw Monsanto we take away their ability to do that. Well, that's really the investor state dispute settlement system which would be a big club for them. Uh, there's a few other kind of refinements to the um, to you know plant the plant disease section of uh, of these agreements. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, WikiLeaks has shown that the State Department is at least has a few people always dedicated to uh, ensuring that you know, Monsanto's products are imported and their policies are imported without any problem. So there, there's more than just the U.S. Uh, uh, trade representative's office working on it. We have the State Department, Congress, and uh, uh, the Florida Agricultural Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and so on and so forth. I mean, they're all, uh, they're all working. but. In terms of the kind of coordination of the agreement, it does run through the president's office. So you have, and, and sometimes you will have um, kind of revolts. Uh, and right now, for example, the Treasury Department is strongly opposed to the inclusion of, of the financial services uh, chapter because they look at the U.S. Trade Representative's office uh, as being uh, both incompetent um, and uh, basically exposing them in the Treasury Department uh, to policies and authorities that conflict with statutory authorities such as the Bank Holding Company Act, which is the basis for a lot of what the Treasury Department does. So, yeah. Um, two part question on the same issue you said. The part of this agreement has got to uh, give companies the right to sue the governments the loss of anticipated profits. First part of the question is this is this shown up in other kinds of free trade agreements or will this be a new provision in this agreement? And secondly, kind of what it seems like it seems on its face kind of crazy to give up any kind of sovereign protection of your the safety of your food supply 
what under what rationale could the government think is, is this likely and kind of what rationale are they saying that this would be a huge risk to the food supply? Well, uh, one of IATP's board members, uh, Steve Schreiman, uh, is a litigator uh, who has uh, represented, for example, the Canadian postal system, uh, defending it against, I think it was um, UPS, if I remember correctly. UPS said no Canadian postal system had an unfair trade advantage, it was not at least trade restrictive, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, you do have, you have investor state in, uh, in all of the regional uh, trade agreements, it's, it has to be used with um, with some discretion because it does require uh, you know some some federal government assets uh, in, in, in the litigation process. And even though there is no penalty for filing a trivial lawsuit, um, there's kind of reputational risk. There have been a few ridiculous lawsuits that were uh, withdrawn pretty quickly. Archer Daniels Middle with your lawsuit that they were going to file against Mexico um, concerning high fructose corn syrup. Um, so this, this, this kind of a is in place in other types of oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, no, very much so. There's a whole. In fact, um, investor state uh, was was cooked up by um, Carla Hills when she was the U.S. Trade Representative, and of course, as soon as she left government service. Uh, her law shop specialized in investor state lawsuits. I mean, she's made a ton of money uh, uh, suing uh, Canada, suing Mexico, and so on and so forth. And usually these are these are kind of um, soft power tools because there are relatively few governments that can withstand all the forms of retaliation, both public and private, that the U.S. government can, uh, can visit upon countries. Um, you know, China, Brazil, you know, there's a handful of developing countries that can withstand that kind of pressure. You know, in Europe, it would be, it'd be, a, it'd be a much, you know, bigger stakes bet. I mean, you'd be, a, in my view, you'd be a real fool to um, say, if you were, if you're Goldman Sachs, um, you'd probably be shooting yourself in the foot if there were a provision in, uh, in European law that block you from doing naked credit default swaps, where you have with absolutely no capital down, and you could make you know tons of tons of money uh, betting against a product that you yourself had sold to an investor, for example, in Greece. I mean, that's how they made tons and tons of money in Greece, hiding Greece's debt until the point when uh, they collapsed, and then. European Central Bank had to bail them out. The Federal Reserve Bank had to bail out the European Central Bank. It's called a, a, a default cascade. Yeah. This is, I'm not sure if I'll be able to figure out how to say this. This is more of a philosophy of economics question, where if you look at, through the whole history of human civilization, it seems like all economic growth is based on an exploitation of an outgroup. Like, you're just externalizing some sort of cost and exploiting a different group to have an economic growth. So how could you ever argue that you have like an economic policy that there are no losers in such like a global interconnected world? You know what I mean? You're like, it seems like, it seems like every single time that people have made money, there's some sort of indirect cost that somebody else has to bear the brunt of. So how could you possibly have an agreement that everybody has economic growth it just doesn't make any sense. Any well, it depends on I think you know how much how much tie back into your domestic economy is there when you design uh, your economy for exportation. Um, and so you know when the World Bank loans money to uh, developing countries, it's generally for. Uh, export infrastructure with no tie back to the domestic economy. And so this means that raw materials uh, get out of you know, the Ivory Coast or whatever at cheap price. Basically, you are subsidizing uh, infrastructure for transnational exports. Um, but you know, if, you, if you tied it back into the domestic economy, um, you could definitely have some benefits. One of the really interesting things that's happened the last couple of years is that uh, Cargill, after joining many other companies 
and exploiting um, cocoa bean growth in, uh, in the Ivory Coast to the point where the cocoa bean plants they weren't producing anymore. The whole, the whole crop just collapsed. They had to invest you know, massive amounts of money uh, in decentralizing and diversifying cocoa production so it wouldn't be vulnerable to these terrible uh, phytosanitary diseases that were just you know, devastating cocoa because everybody wants chocolate, right? And so um, they actually led the way. And then there were a couple of other, there's a Kaiyu, and there's, there's a couple of other really big uh, chocolate producers and cocoa importers. You know, so uh, I mean, there is a, there is this uh, you know theory of, of of trade negotiations called mercantilism, in which you are always trying to uh, undermine your trade negotiations partner. But that's pretty dumb trade policy. I mean, there, that that's sort of uh, what you get when you have somebody who's coming straight out of graduate school and doesn't know any better. Pardon me. Especially pardons to those who you just came uh, straight out of graduate school. <laughs> but there tends to be a really aggressive, especially the people who come out of, of the Ivy League, I dare say, think that uh, that they actually do are, are going to inherit here. Um, and um, unhappily, uh, a lot of these people get appointed to be uh, assistant trade negotiators. And, um, and they are very, very um, Instructed. Sometimes you cannot actually have a conversation with them. They will really repeat whatever the line of the day is as it's handed down from the chief negotiator. Yeah. But even like externalized, through, like the cost externalized through time, like you said that like really clever people can make everything look like they know what they're doing and everybody's winning until they're retired and don't have to deal with that anymore and everything falls apart. Like, every, not everyone can't win. Well, like in a closed global system. Yeah, and then, well, the question is whether the, the, the system is closed or not, and you know what kind of economy you're talking about. I mean, yeah. you, you want to talk about uh, you know political economy at a philosophical level? You can go back to Aristotle's uh, economics, and he, he distinguishes between two kinds of economics. There's crestomathia, which are the economics of, of fighting war and kind of diplomatic showcasing and so on and so forth, and, and then you have. Economica, which has to do with the, the economy of, of the heart, really the domestic economy, that economy which of you know, supports uh, the, the demos, the, the, the people of the world. Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of of, uh, of, of trade policy um, has that kind of um, foreign policy soft power element to it. And then things sometimes get really crazy, like let's have a trade agreement so we can shut out China because that will surely work, right? But but that's you know that's one of those odd things that you find in the proverbial Georgetown, you know, solo. <laughs> We're doing this line of thought. We can definitely continue. I just want to make sure. Yeah, I should. I should probably. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me kick into the uh, to the the way that the U.S. trade policy system works. Um, so IATP at one point in its history, our, our, our president Mark Ritchie uh, was uh, was appointed to the Trade and Environment Policy Advisory Committee. So this is one of about 35 committees. There are about uh, 550 cleared advisors. Um, the trade involved, in, so it's called TPAC, the Trade and Environment Policy Advisory Committee. Um, was um, so ineffectual that Mark didn't go, but had me uh, sit in for him on, on the uh, on the conference calls. Uh, however, there are other um, policy committees which actually have some substantive rule role, including the Agricultural Policy Advisory Committee. Um, the negotiations texts um, are under the map, the kind of lowest level of military classification. So if you um, if you divulged text uh, and the FBI caught you doing so, uh, you would be you know, not only drummed out of, out of uh, government, but you would be uh, uh, subject to all the criminal sanctions that the FBI could throw at you. Uh, a, a, a new uh, U.S. Trade representative who thought that uh, the investor state provision in the Chilean U.S. free trade agreement uh, was going to be unjust in Chile. Uh, she had her apartment tossed and you know, lost her job and so on and so forth, and they make sure that you, uh, that you never work here. 
Um, now, these kind of, this, uh, this the, the, uh, the trade policy advisory system, like in theory, would be subject to the federal, um, uh, uh, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, uh, the FACA. And um, under the FACA, uh, the president could withdraw the exemption um, that allows for all of the secrecy. And to tell you just how pervasive the culture of secrecy has been in the launch of the TAFTA is um, my, uh, my colleague, Karen Hanson Cody, who uh, went to a stakeholder event at the U.S. Trade Representative's office in Washington, um, was asked for her business card after she gave a presentation. A guy comes up to her, asks for her business card. She gives him the business card, and uh, she asks for his business card. I mean, who is he? And, and, and the guy just says, well, you can say I'm somebody from commerce. Right? So, I mean, I mean, here you have people who are public servants and pretending you know, that they are under you know, some kind of bizarre uh, uh, secrecy code where they can't even divulge their name. Now, I, I personally think this is just uh, you know, somebody, this is not policy that US government officials can no longer give their names in public meetings. But, but it is kind of, I don't know, indicative of just the extent to which uh, the, the TTIP will be governed by uh, the presidential order on secrecy for uh, trade policy. These are not private commercial agreements involving trade secrets. If they were private commercial agreements, you know, let's say between, I don't know, Cargill and Monsanto, um, you could legitimately claim in court law uh, that these, for example, a joint adventure contract would be subject to some you know, confidentiality agreements. These are talking about public policy uh, uh, regulations, legislation, uh, and you know, our view is that uh, as such, uh, trade negotiations policies. You know, obviously, you you're, you're going to have draft policies that you may not want to put in the public. But once once there is agreement about what is to be negotiated, it should be put out on the website and made open for, you know, for criticism and debate by all concerned. This is what's happened in the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, when the commission, I've, I've actually seen my own letters to the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, cited in the regulatory rulings. Um, and this is because they have a complete open door policy. And this is for an industry that is ever so much more lucrative than what they're talking about in the, in the TTIP. Um, and so it's a, it's a very peculiar uh, uh, use of presidential authority. One of the other uh, procedural issues involved in the TTIP and other free trade agreements is something called fast track authority. Basically, uh, the Congress uh, abjures its um, constitutional responsibility to advise and approve uh, treaties. And instead, uh, it allows itself not to see the text of the treaty until they come before Congress with the provision that they cannot be amended by Congress. They must be voted up or down, by which time, of course, the stakes are so high um, and the political vulnerabilities are so great that nobody who uh, uh, you know, wants to get any money from a corporation, which a corporation, or uh, be a Republican or Republican Party will turn it down, and a lot of Democrats are, um, are at a, a, a so-called free trade agreement. And uh, there is a lot of support among the developing country governments, especially for the fast track policy, because that's how they negotiate. They negotiate trade agreements um, uh, without any kind of democratic participation or public comment. So you know, for them, uh, this is a very important yeah, area. Um, there are um, alternative uh, trade policy negotiating mandates that have been proposed. Senator Sharon Brown of Ohio uh, has proposed uh, just I think, three weeks ago uh, the 21st Century Trade Agreements and Market Access Act. And this is something that's both procedural and substantive. Uh, some of it refers to the automobile industry, which plays a major uh, role in Ohio, uh, uh, Ohio economy. And, um, and so, you know, there is some alternative to this fast track authority out there, but 
Uh, fast track authority uh, is granted for a specific period of time. Uh, that period has expired at some point uh, in order to uh, present uh, the, the TTIP text to Congress for a vote uh, that he or his successor will be asking for fast track authority. Uh, it would be very, it, it would be a very, very great and pleasant surprise if the kind of uh, trade negotiations mandate that uh, Senator Sh uh, Brown is proposing would become the law of the world. So that's section two. I told you to be short. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what are your theories as to the reasons for all this? Well, some of it is that um, there are um, public policies that um, various constituencies have, have fought very hard for. I, I was going to kind of, my, I guess I'm sort of advancing the substance here. Right for example, there's an asthma drug called ractopamine produced by Dalalanko. Uh, and uh, they discovered a new use for it to, uh, to feed to capital box to uh, increase their so-called feed efficiency. So they become fatter uh, right before they're slaughtered. Um, there is an international standard that was approved in a bitter vote um, in last July. By, by the Codex, the Codex Alimentarius Commission, which is the International Food Standards Body. This, it was approved by one vote. Basically, uh, the U.S. Ambassador to Food and Agriculture Organization spent the entire night calling uh, embassies and bribing them to, to pass this. Uh, several embassies reversed their votes. But the worst thing about this is that um, the entire standard is based on six studies. And these studies are from the late 80s and the, uh, uh, and the early 1990s. And three of them are by uh, uh, the company that made this veterinary drug, which has been in use in the United States, I think, for about 15 years or so. Um, and so you have a, a number of countries, China and European Union member states included, that don't want to use the, uh, this um, this veterinary drug. So, if you're if you're in TTIP and you want to design a sanitary phytosanitary consultative mechanism, which allows the, the government allows allows companies to give secret testimony to governments that the public cannot see. Um, well, that would be one reason that you would want to maintain secrecy because you wouldn't want to be putting out there studies that other people can ridicule. Um, one of the bizarre things about, about ractopamine is that um, uh, it is supposedly used for, uh, for beef cattle exports. Uh, and yet all those studies only pertain to hogs. Right? So you don't even know, you don't even have a scientific evidentiary basis for the so-called science-based decision that enables trade of meat produced uh, with cattle that have been feeding them ractopamine. Uh, uh, and there are other, you know, provisions you could, you could, well, I'm, I'm kind of straying into the substance issues here, but does anybody have questions, any more questions about the, our trade policy by two system that we can solve it How do you see the be related to the fact that somebody has to pay for it? So then if you have secret conversations with each person and no one's like holding you accountable when you're saying like, oh no, you'll, you'll get all the benefits of this, you know? Or they'll get the benefits and they'll pay for it. But if, you, if you're a false secret, then you never be able to pinpoint who... Well, among the clearly industry advisors, so you know, for the companies that are represented, um, you know, they are, they are obviously going to have some differences because they have different products and, and um, you know, different degrees of foreign investment. They have some, you know, some, uh, some companies are truly global, like Cargill. Other companies are very kind of regionally focused, maybe just in a few countries. And so they have very specific uh, 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 
needs, and, and those are worked out in this kind of uh, uh, trade policy by trade process. Um, you know, and so for that purpose, uh, you know, secrecy uh, you know, prevents not only a, a broader discussion of the public policy objectives in, in, in trade policy, but also um, serves to mask differences among different industry groups and within industry groups. So, so it has a lot of uses. And, uh, and it also makes it, it, it also makes life just easier for um, all of the, the diplomats who are involved. I mean, they're, they're always telling you, "Well, I can't talk about that." So they have these things called listening sessions, which drive NGOs crazy because you are giving them the information that you have, and there's nothing coming in return. It, it's it's kind of pathetic. You wonder how people can draw a salary doing that, but they do. Uh, well, I should, I should say that, but at any rate, um, should, you want, should we move to the substantive issues? How are we doing on time? Okay. Okay. So, what is proposed um, in the, for the TTIP, and it's, it's, it's a very, very primitive form right now, but we, we can learn some things from the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, documents, which you know, in, in the TTIP documents, especially as uh, uh, discussed, that government officials leak them. Uh, IATP, if, if we actually we leak them ourselves, we'd be prosecuted. But uh, at least thus far, we can't be prosecuted for posting. That's right. That's, I'm counting on our, 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 our lawyers here. Um, because yeah, we have posted a few documents. Um, and so what we know about the, uh, the sanitary, fight sanitary uh, mechanism, sanitary referring to uh, animal health, animal diseases, and fight sanitary referring to plant diseases and crops, um, is that the strategy of the United States is they don't want to uh, challenge European legislation on uh, sanitary and fight sanitary issues. Uh, because that would create a huge public controversy. And so this, this uh, consultant mechanism is supposed to uh, simply allow the U.S. to challenge how the rules are implemented. Okay. So, uh, and this, re this, this, you know, involves huge amounts of billable hours for lawyers. And so they just love this because they can say, well, you know, you didn't treat this transgenic event, right? This this particular GMO variety the same as this GMO variety, and therefore your whole entire mechanism for reviewing GMOs is faulty, and therefore we can sue you under the Investor State Act, for example. So what what the um, what the mechanism is supposed to do is to um, allow member countries to. Uh, argue their differences before they go to litigation. But uh, as long as litigation is uh, a very real and, and um, present danger, and there are such great differences of scale of economy between you know, Bulgaria and the United States, or I don't know, uh, Liechtenstein and the United States, uh, uh, you know, that's a very powerful threat. Um, there's also the technical barriers to trade consultant mechanism, and maybe the, the technical barrier to trade which is most familiar to most people would be the labeling barriers. So for example, uh, uh, the European Parliament has passed a resolution that all products with uh, uh, engineered nanoscale materials, that is atom scale, molecular scale materials that are incorporated in consumer products. So for example, nano silver with socks, so that you will never have, you know, your your fungal bacteria will you know, will not survive on your feet. Um, and the European Parliament has proposed that all of those products will be labeled as such. And the American Chemical Association, or excuse me, yeah, the American Chemical Association told the USTR that that if the European Parliament ever passed legislation labeling uh, nanomaterial products. Um, that they should take them to dispute settlement. Okay. So that would certainly be a feature. That would, that's a very likely subject for litigation. If you uh, if you were labeling nanomaterials and, uh, and the United States people, this is discriminating against 
the industry, we invested all this money, and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, so this would be a place where where uh, you could have, even if even if there were no regulation of these products of nanomaterials, the fact that you could label the products could be subject for uh, for litigation. Is that true for GMO as well? GMO labeling? Uh, yeah. Yes. Sure. I just thought the nanomaterial example would be better because fewer people might know about it. GMOs are true. And, and, and with GMOs, I mean, the, uh, you know, there, again, you're getting into definitions of what they call uh, adventitious presence. Is it, is, it, is it present in an amount that changes the nature of a product? And as, as one of my colleagues in Geneva says, Trade agreements are a paradise for one. Right? Just infinite amount of, of minor, minuscule detail. Yes? I know we're not in the question section, so I'm just kind of jumping in. It's, I always, okay. it's always questions. Okay, so we're okay. Good. So That's what percolating is all about. In, in, the, in, in terms of the contract of people, what is it that people in Europe or people here? Well, I, I, I know in Europe you have much more severe reactions to this agreement than you do in the United States. And, and that's partially because of the European Union has a federation of 28 different states and I think like 24 different languages. And that doesn't count like Basque or Catalan, but you know, kind of the national languages. And they, they survive by a very intense process of consultation. And that includes consultation with environmental groups and, 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 uh, and consumer groups, a, 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 kind of, a kind of process that we don't have in the United States. So when I started working on transatlantic issues in 2000, uh, uh, I was really impressed about how distinct this was from the US, from the US process. And um, I represent IETP and a network called the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue. Um, the European Commission funds their consumers, uh, funds their NGOs to criticize them, right? Whereas the US government, it's very top-down, very industry-oriented. And so what Europe, what, what European civil society fears is that they will be, that, that European governments will become more like the United States. And indeed, uh, uh, Brussels, which is the, the seat of the European Commission and the European Parliament, uh, is now flooded uh, with U.S. lobbyists. The lobby culture in Washington has been transplanted uh, to Brussels. Uh, and of course, there is a, uh, 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 an NGO that dedicates itself entirely to analyzing who is lobbying and what. It's called the Corporate European Observatory. It's a wonderful uh, NGO. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., you have such a uh, corporate-dominated government that uh, I don't think there's the, there's the feeling of a sense of loss. Right, uh, but, but you feel it. I'm just saying, is it, you know, is it we won't be able to have any food safety? I mean, in the broadest terms, like, is it environmental protections, food safety? Yeah, I, I, I can't tell you what, you know, sort of what's at the top. I mean, I, I, if, if I were... Isn't it commerce? Is that top? Anything that, that uh, reduces commerce, reduces profits. I mean, what, if you were trying to mobilize people and say, guys, you should all write to President Obama and... Well, that was actually going to be part five of the... <laughs> but why would anyone do it? Like, what's the next, what's the rest of that sentence? Like, what, because... You should all write to whoever we're supposed to write to because, and because otherwise, if this goes through the way they're planning it, like, like what's the, like the, I, I, I don't Well, you know, my, my, my proclivities right now, I mean, I, I basically, if, if there's a, a financial services agreement, financial services agreement 
plus an investor state agreement, you could have uh, the destruction of the Dodd-Frank Act, um, which for the first time in the generation, two generations, regulates the financial services industry. The damage that's been caused to the U.S. economy, I mean, we're talking very conservatively $13 trillion, right? If, I mean, it's hard to imagine what would happen if that happens again, because now the banks are so much bigger. But they could readily default. I mean, they're, they're, you know, so I, I guess if I were to, from a kind of political organizer viewpoint, yeah. select one issue, that would no, be the or, issue. Or, or even to say, uh, you know, these five things. Like, so, so one is that the, the financial services will be even further directed, deregulated, and, and the, it will make it harder to regulate or impossible. Well, you basically are giving, you're giving rights to one um, set of entities, transnational corporations, that nobody else has. I mean, counties don't have it, states don't have it, but you and you can't, we can't sue them. They don't already have those rights under the, the bi bilaterals, you know? Yeah, well, they don't have it. It's, it's a lot more difficult for them to operate it. And it's, it's much more, from a trade policy negotiations viewpoint, it's more efficient if everybody's bound. You get, you got 29 member countries that are bound together, then you can operate under that one agreement and scare the hell out of the other 27 that are not in litigation. If you have to do everything bilaterally, it, it bogs down. Even the transnational corporations might lose interest in litigating. Uh -huh. um, and of course, there's always the possibility that the government that approved the tax would be overthrown. I mean, that, that's certainly, um, a very real present danger. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think there's real national security implications too. To Steve, that. could you talk a bit about yeah. the harmonization of standards as well that could be a part of this, or is that in another part? Or? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm still in the substantive part here. I can, yeah, I can talk about that. One of the things that uh, they're, they're, they're trying to do is to prevent re uh, litigation through what they call regulatory coherence. But uh, when, when I was in Washington on June 10th, we met with um, the nanotechnology, they're not really nanotechnology negotiators, but the people who are responsible for nanotechnology in the U.S. Trade Representative's office. And, uh, and the basic message was, was this, was IATP has been part of two lawsuits, and these were, it's kind of pathetic. You, you, all you're trying to get them to do is to force the Office of Management Budget, a presidential office, uh, to release a rule for public comment, right? And so, uh, one of the one of the issues with with what we call emerging technology, synthetic biology, nanotechnology, these are unregulated industries, and yet they're trying to design a framework, a regulatory regulatory coherence that could be coherence between non-regulatory regimes, what are called approval regimes. You know, and it, the basic message to, that we had for USDR was, for God's sake, don't try to um, write a regulatory coherence chapter when the major industries that you're directing this chapter to are not regulated. Right? So, I mean, at this point, it gets pretty, it gets pretty strange. Um, it, you know, regarding uh, financial services, the, the claim by the negotiators is that this is not about deregulation, it's only about liberalization. But um, uh, liberalization also involves requirements for registering the firm. And depending on how you define registration, um, those, uh, those firms will be covered or not covered by, uh, by regulation. So you can effectively deregulate a firm depending on how, how it, uh, the registration requirement is designed in the trade agreement. Uh, and, and you can multiply that through different, different uh, uh, financial, different kinds of financial institutions. You know, the hedge funds, insurance companies, investment banks, bank holding companies, and so on and so forth. So that's a, a real, um, but one of the things that we, we do know about, we do have some history not only with the investors, it's been 
by, by comparison, the WTO dispute settlement uh, uh, process is relatively transparent. I mean, uh, NGOs can submit amicus briefs, um, the WTO with some delay, because uh, we we hope to publish the, the decisions, but they will publish uh, the decisions. You, you don't have that investor state. Uh, evident, the evidentiary norms are very irregular. Uh, uh, they're secretive. Um, it, it's closer to a, a star chamber, a medieval torture chamber, and a court rather than you know something that you would associate with due process. Um, and, and for this reason, and, and here I kind of close the substantive section. Um, the departing uh, director general of the WTO, uh, Pascal Lamy, a, a fierce defender of, of free trade, is very critical of uh, of these regional free trade agreements, and especially the TTIP, because he basically sees wherever it says in the TTIP that um, that this 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 agreement. Uh, is based in the WTO agreements, and uh, we are just going to go beyond them. He, he basically sees a lot of room for contradiction and undermining uh, of the agreement, uh, above all because of, this, of the nature of the uh, investor state, which is which is nowhere uh, in the WTO agreement. The WTO agreement only states can sue states. Now, some companies are basically providing the ammunition uh, for suing, but they don't have any legal standing. They can't initiate a lawsuit. And so uh, this is a very, uh, the TTIP uh, is a very different creature. More questions about the kind of the substance of what we know about that might be? How are we doing on time? We have about 14 minutes left. Oh. Either. All right, well, I mean, I'm going to sort of jump ahead. Here, why don't I do this? I'm going to, because these are two very short sections. Um, one is just what is IATP doing about the TTIP? And then, you know, what can you do? So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we always question the wisdom of, you know, if there's anything to be gained from going to these listening sessions or stakeholder events. Um, that the U.S. Trade uh, Office representative puts on occasionally, basically, to try to quell the masses because they're meeting every day with industry representatives, right? And then once, twice, three times a year, they have these stakeholder events uh, for civil society. Um, you know, every once in a while, you'll meet somebody that you wouldn't otherwise meet. Um, and that sometimes could be you know, worthwhile. Uh, we do participate in the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, which has a, kind of a semi-official status, uh, really a status bestowed by the European Commission, because to tell you a little bit of the difference between the European Commission approach to trade negotiations and the US Trade Representative Office approach, the European Commission approach is paid for the Secretariat of the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue for 12 years, about 13 years. Um, and the United States has never contributed more than sandwiches, coffee, and potato chips <laughs> in awful State Department meetings. One year, the, the, uh, the commission was so embarrassed uh, by the way that we were treated by the Bush, Bush administration and State Department that they demanded a public apology. Right? So it's a very different kind of negotiating culture, even though we think that you know, some of the European Union's uh, negotiating objectives are very bad, but they have a very different political culture, and it's partially what they need to do in order to make the 28 uh, member states cohere uh, politically. Um, one of the things that uh, we are also involved in is kind of um, a US-EU TTIP coalition, which is not limited. Uh, to consumer organizations. And these, um, at least the European members, tend to be of the more radical uh, no TTIP whatsoever. Um, and that's a hard place to negotiate from, especially since the governments are throwing hundreds of millions of dollars uh, into, into this negotiation. So, you know, we're going to be in a position basically where we're uh, leaking documents um, and trying to uh, uh, impress upon the Obama administration that uh, more uh, trade negotiation secrecy is going to lead to uh, a worse agreement. It's not going to be an agreement they're going to want to implement, and certainly not an agreement they're going to want to defend before Congress. Uh, my personal view is that uh, 
President Obama will be building his library, his foundation, and watching his girls graduate from college before this is concluded. But there are optimists who think that can be done two years. You know, and I'm certainly not in a position to really to gain some of those. It all really depends on um, how it's negotiated and how they uh, pressure uh, the European institutions and the US Congress. So what can you do about TTIP and the other FDAs? Well, of course, you have to visit the ITP website to <laughs> find out what we're doing and you know, friend us on Facebook and so on and so forth. But Andrew will explain to you all the, uh, the technical details of what we do with communications on these issues. I, I would also, you know, TTIP is such a, a, a huge monster, it really is a monster, um, that has relatively legal, with the exception of the investor state uh, uh, chapter, which sort of unites everything, um, there's a lot of kind of technical specificity. So, you know, if you are interested in food safety issues, um, you know, Make a study of the SPS consultant mechanism and the SPS agreement in the WTO. Um, if you have uh, a, a, an interest in um, in local foods, uh, look at the government procurement chapter. You know, what, what does it say about um, your right to uh, buy locally? Uh, members of Congress have TTIP pretty for most of them. Uh, you know, shared around it, maybe half a dozen other members of Congress accepted, <clears throat> have uh, TTIP as a pretty low uh, uh, part of their uh, kind of policy profile. But it's going to heat up. It's going to heat up fast. And uh, certainly we will want to uh, demand uh, town halls um, on TTIP on negotiations. Especially, I, I should think that the members of Congress would be embarrassed because they can't even see uh, the negotiated text while they're being negotiated. They're basically in the same position as civil society. Here, take this 500-page, uh, uh, 500 or 8,000-page agreement, I don't know how long it will be, and, uh, and vote it up or down. And, and here's, here's, and usually these, these votes are scheduled on very short notice, so they're not gonna be able to read the whole thing. And they'll be lucky if they have, uh, if they can afford to have a staff member who is really tracking uh, uh, trade policy. <coughs> You should certainly offer to publicize uh, the town hall meeting. And when the elections come around, uh, you know, you do have the opportunity to, uh, to propose public policy uh, planks and challenge uh, uh, candidates in electoral forums and say, okay, you know, we've got this proposed trade agreement, which is supposed to help us recover from the devastating deregulation of the financial services industry. Uh, you know, what, what's your what's your position? What do you know? Um, what have you uh, what have you uh, thought about Senator uh, uh, Brown's uh, legislation? And so on and so forth. So you do have you do have some options here. Uh, we are going to do what we can to uh, leak documents to um, try to compare this. Um, both agreement with those agreements, such as the Canadian uh, EU free trade agreement, which is much further along, where we have more developed text, um, and to try to do uh, uh, some writing and some uh, advocacy work. So, uh, with that, I close my presentation. And look forward to your to your questions. There is, it's all leaked. There's nothing, nothing there is nothing that is officially released. And so with the Canadian one too, that's been leaked? Or? Friends of ours have sent a nearly complete, we don't have the investment chapter, but I just got it today. And it's, but it's, uh, it, it, Canadian banking is actually pretty well regulated. They didn't go, they didn't go down the tubes the way we did. Uh, Mark Carney, who is a uh, former Central Banker of Canada, is now in charge of the Bank for International Settlements. He's not going to be too happy if his work is undone. And so that, the financial services agreement has caused the Canadian EU free trade agreement to hit the wall. So, and that, that could well happen with the TTIP. Dr. Kennedy, 
Yeah, okay. yeah. I just wanted to uh, get back to Andrew's question about harmonization, and if you could just explain harmonization and maybe how it could how it undermines uh, policy already in existence for public safety, such as how Europe has reach for chemical safety, and then harmon and the U.S. has Tusca, which hasn't really been updated since the 1970s, and how harm harmonization would actually kind of dismantle. Europe's progressive chemical policies, and yeah, har harmonization can work, uh, you know, two ways. I mean, there's a kind of. Um, can you explain what it is? Yeah. So, well, there's what I call fictional harmonization, uh, which is essentially a kind of uh, lawyers' agreement to mutually recognize each other's standards with absolutely no substantive content, um, uh, and. This is what's being proposed, for example, for the financial services industry. In mature and smart harmonization, what you do instead of like recognizing a whole system in the old, you know, regal sense of I recognize you to you know take your hat off the presence of the king, um, the because that's where it comes from. Uh, the uh, in in subsequent harmonization, you are actually comparing rules and how the rules apply and what kind of infrastructure you have. And you agree to say, OK, um, you want to import or you want to export your aquaculture products to us. And this is, these are what our aquaculture uh, rules are uh, concerning water, concerning use of veterinary drugs, uh, concerning feed rules, and so on and so forth. And uh, first they do a, a, a kind of a paper comparison. Uh, then they go, and then in a smart harmonization, you go over and you say, well, uh, this looks pretty good on paper, but you don't have the staff to implement this. Or, um, you know, we are going to require um, at least uh, two uh, unannounced audits a year of your production facilities. The United States right now has a U.S. Uh, China Food Safety Agreement, which is an example of sort of uh, the, the combination of really bad harmonization and passable harmonization. Uh, so they, they they don't inspect product. Uh, they only inspect the export facilities. And they don't have unannounced audits because the Chinese don't like that. And uh, and so there you, you've got, you've got kind of a paper comparison that uh, supports the food safety bureaucrats in Beijing, but it really doesn't extend to the provincial officials who actually have to examine uh, the production facilities, aquaculture production facilities. So, um, you know, under, under the TTIP, you have, uh, you would have a harmonization structure, and then this would be left up to uh, the individual agencies to say, okay, this is what we're going to do about veterinary drugs. So there might be, uh, for example, um, kind of a veterinary drugs annex to the SPS chapter. It can get fairly, it can get fairly sophisticated. It can also get really um, uh, deceptive and essentially uh, unimplementable you know, and unenforceable. Yeah. Is harmonization historically, has it not been sort of a race to the bottom? Like, we have strict, the, the fact that we do, yeah, but let's say we have a, a, you know, a good law that protects food safety or the environment or uh, favoring local foods or, or whatever, and someone else has a less strict law, and to harmonize, you have to both have the same to make the playing field the same. Do I have this right? And doesn't it usually go down, not up? Um, so we, we, we it, it, it depends. It depends right? what the you know what the, the governments are willing to fight for. I mean, Patrick just uh, mentioned uh, you know our, our Toxic Substance Control Act of 1967. I think since 1967, it's banned five chemicals. It's got no. It's got no infrastructure. Right. We're bad. Europe's bad. We can look at it that way. When we harmonize, is it likely that that Europe's brought down to our level? Well, so it, in my view, you know, harmonization is a kind of a, a necessary fact of life for, for trade facilitation. 
if you are bringing, you know, a chemical, a veterinary drug, a uh, 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 feed stuff, you're going to look at um, you're, you're going to look at some kind of standard. You know, but so wouldn't it be required to go to the? Couldn't it be uh, it, it depends, you know. For example, uh, when there was a Canadian, when there was a Canadian wheat board, uh, most U.S. wheat could be shipped to Canada because it had too much non-wheat content. The U.S. Grain Inspection Service allows much more, you know, wood shavings, rat poop, metal shavings, God knows what all, in its wheat shipments. And the Canadian wheat board, it just wouldn't pass the quality test, right? So, if your government is willing to defend that standard. Um, you know, harmonization can work for you. You can say, okay, you know, you can export your wheat to us, but it has to meet the standards. And, you know, again, a lot of it really depends on, uh, you know, is your industry and your government willing to stand up uh, to possible trade retaliation? Is this is the government's willingness to stand up for it, though, um, uh, slowed or prevented by industrial pressure, I mean, from corporate interests. I mean, talk about maybe a little bit about the European example of... I, I hate to interrupt this question, but we are now officially over time, and I know that other people have, have things to go to. So coffee shops actually opened until 8 this morning, and so I would suggest that you grab another latte and hang out and chat a little bit more, but if there are people who need to move on, we need to step ahead. I, I am happy to talk a little longer after that. Be, uh, You've been very engaging audience. So I, <laughs> uh, I don't Because I've met these people and they will talk till midnight. I'm not even about that age. So. Well, <laughs> I don't think we have that much. Thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you. Steve, real quick again, you gave the name, of, I think it was like the corporate European some observer. Observer. Yeah, CEO. Tremendous, uh, <laughs> tremendous organization. Yeah. Like, earlier, yeah. 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 Like, 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 y